Rah Hogan for the Boxing Boys. I'm delighted to be here with John David Jackson, two time world champion. How are you, John? I'm doing well, and yourself? I'm fantastic. Is this your first time in London? No, no, no. I've been here plenty of times. You know, London. Been in Sorry, we're in Wales. <laughs> and, um, Leicester, Leicester, England. Uh huh. Back in 1989. So, yes, yeah, so I've been a few times. Okay, I, mean, I actually wanted to speak to you because one of my great boxing memories from my childhood. If, you, if you'll indulge me, turn back the clock, 1994, the Ring <laughs> Magazine's Fight of the Year, yeah. uh, fantastic card that Don King put That's on cool. in Monterey, Mexico. You put on an absolute boxing masterclass for eight rounds. And before, eight and a half. Eight and a half, eight and, a half. and then uh, yeah. Castro. I got careless, I got careless. All, all fight, he was looking for a Hail Mary, and yeah. unfortunately well, he found it, but what a fight. Yeah, you know, it, it was a bit of a grudge match because you know they, they stripped me of my title unjustly. They had no reason why they stripped me of it other than the fact that they wanted to catch the champion. So when we fought for that title, it was like to me to do or die because when they stripped me of my title, it kind of took 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 something from me. You know, I just didn't really want to box anymore. But I wanted to get him to, to prove that it was unjust, just be taken. So for eight and a half hours. I'd be the crap out of you know, and you, you got to think about it. it was, to me, it was still kind of fixed because, not the punch, but two fights after that, that, that same night, I think it was Chavez fought, uh, well, not, it wasn't Hogan, it, it wasn't Hogan. It was, uh, Randall? Frankie uh, Randall? No, it wasn't Frankie Randall. He fought, um, he fought somebody and, and it was a cut. They stopped on a cut, a nick, in the third round. Now, if you remember that fight with Castro and I, he had both eyes cut, I broke his nose, I knocked two of his teeth out, and they couldn't stop the fight? Mm -hmm. Come on. And I was ahead, one more thing, one judge had me ahead by nine points, seven points, and five points. So I couldn't lose the fight. Uh -huh. But, <laughs> It's the, the, the dirty side of boxing that <laughs> all you fighters eventually have to deal with. I mean, I remember at the time you did say you felt you had to take that risk and go for the stoppage because you were not just fighting cash flow, you were fighting the WBA as well. At the time, did you have problems with King as well? Not, you know, actually, I, I didn't have problems with any of those promoters. I wouldn't sign with them. That, that was now that was my biggest problem. I wouldn't sign with King. I wouldn't sign with them. I wouldn't sign with main events because I didn't really trust any of them. Uh, some of my friends had been with each promoter, and things were kind of bad for them financially. So I, you know, and, and that was one of my drawbacks in, in, in my fight because, well, like when I fight Chris Fight, I had to go to Leicester to defend my title because I forgot the most money, and but I was in, I was in his in his in his backyard, so you know I was taking a big risk. But I, in all my defenses, I did that because I didn't care. I I, I, I thought I was the best, and I would go there just to you know get the what money I could get. But I, I wouldn't sign with the big promoters because I didn't trust them. And that was that was one of my downfalls. I should have signed with someone to make my role easy. But I, I would, and you know, Don kept saying he wanted to sign me. And, you know, I signed with him after I lost to Castro. But up to that point, I didn't trust anyone. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe King wanted to punish you or send you a message that hey, that you don't sign with me, oh. you don't, you don't get any favors? He did see, he, I did get punished because after I signed with him, uh, Carl King came to me and said, "You know, you know, my dad's gonna dog you out." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "He's gonna put you on the show because you've been signed with him all these years. He's trying to get you." And look, you know, true to form, that's what happened. So you know, it, it was. But at that point, I, I, at that point, I had to go to Don because he had all the middleweights. Mm -hmm. So I was, in, I was in a bad situation. When I was champion, I had to worry about that. But, you know. Well, you gave us some great memories in some of them them <laughs> fights. So uh, I'm sure I will speak for the fans when we really thank you for that. And it's good to see you passing on your considerable bo boxing knowledge on now to Clarissa and other fighters. Just want to ask you a bit about the the coaching and, and maybe how it's changed because it seems to be a, a, a trend in modern times a, a lot of these guys they're turning pro with minimal amateur experience but they're getting by on athletic ability someone like AJ and uh, Deontay Wilder are perfect examples of that um, or you get the other end of the spectrum like your heavyweight Majidov they stay as an amateur for such a long time that they're eventually old when they become a pro. Back in your day, you had a very thorough sort of amateur background. You know, you had Golden Gloves and 
Olympic trials, all of that, but you would turn pro and you'd still be young yeah. to pick up the, the pro game. Have you had to change your, your, your coaching because of that? Not with Clarissa, obviously, because she's young and she has a tremendous amateur career, but you know, the, these other guys who don't have either much amateur experience, or in the case of Majidov, too much. I haven't had to really change my style or what I do. But what, I, what I've kind of realized in boxing is it's just twofold because one problem is everyone's being micromanaged. They have six, eight fights and now they want to give a title shot. You haven't had a box yet, not professional. You might be good amateur. But there's certain things that a professional needs to learn, and these guys haven't been taught that. Now, the second, the second half of that twofold question you gave me is the trainers and so called out, out there today are not teachers of boxing. A lot of these guys. You ever watch when Roger and Floyd would do the midwork together? Great. It's a great thing. But what people didn't realize, behind closed doors, Roger and Floyd worked. They didn't do that behind the back pack. You know, they looked great, but they worked. They worked on certain things to make Floyd better in each fight. And so today's fighters and some, some, some teachers, they, uh, they don't, they can't teach, but they want, they want everybody to be like Floyd and then Roger. Everybody can be like Floyd Rogers. That was their thing, and it worked for them because, like I said, behind closed doors, they trained hard for their fights. They didn't keep them the same pad work crap they did. But all these young kids, that's all, that's all they see now. Oh, they want to be like Floyd, you know, and they want to have the, 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 the Philly show defense. There's more to it than just that. But since, the, since today's teachers, a lot of good fighters don't continue on and teach fighters how to box. You know, a lot of my friends that were champions, they no longer in the game. I tell them, get back. I said, you know, just maybe, maybe you might want to do a, a, a Golden Glove team or something. Just teach kids or something. Teach somebody. Because today's so-called trainers, they're terrible. Like, they, they never, half these guys never fought. Never had a fight. Professional or amateur. They're going to teach you how to fight and they can't fight. <laughs> you know. Indeed. Well, what do you think is the reason for that? Is it, I mean, the great Evander Holyfield said that America hasn't had a great heavyweight for 30 years because the investment in the amateur scene dried up after the Cold War. Is, is that why that the, there just isn't the money there to, to you know, to give trainers? You know, I was, I was what watching they need? A, a great question you said. I was watching a, doc, a documentary today, and I didn't realize that amateur boxing is so underfunded now. Period. I mean, I know the boys club back when Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, he stopped all that. The boat, he stopped the, the boys club of America for the kids, for the youth. But I didn't realize that boxing is dried up so much as far as from a financial standpoint of backing that there, there really are no more boys clubs. There, there are no more boxing gyms for these kids to go and train for free because the government's not subsidizing that. You know, they allow them to do that. So I, you know, I didn't realize how far back amateur boxing is, is taking a step. And, you know, it's, and it's bad because there's a lot of good fighters out there. You know, everybody can't be a basketball player, a football player. You know, you're 5'2", 215 pounds, you better be a super flyweight. You know, that's <laughs> your best bet. And unless something can change where, you know, it's either government subsidy or whatever, private, you know, there may need to be put in a pot for these kids to be able to excel in a sport that a lot of them probably love boxing, but they just can't have, have no way to, you know, venture into it. So, you know, if, if we can't come up with a solution to make boxing, once again, glamorous and, 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 and ha fun for these kids, then, you know, it might be a lost art for these. Yeah, I mean, one of our uh, Olympic heroes of the past, Audley Harrison, he's been on online talking a lot, but he made a very good point. He said that his, his pro coaching career had a tradition that went back a hundred years. There's his coach, Th uh, Thel Torrance, I think it was, mm, okay. yeah, um, learn yeah, under yeah, Eddie yeah, Futch yeah, yeah. and saying, in, in the UK we don't really have that, but in America, traditionally, at least up until the 90s, you had these old school coaches that the knowledge went back like decades. And as you said, is, is that dying out? I mean, you well, might be one of the last. I'm having said that, I guess you bring up some great points. Here's the thing, in, in, in England, you got Chris Pye. You got, you, know, you got Chris Eubanks Sr. You got Nigel Ben. I know Nigel's in Australia now. But you have all these good fighters, all these great champions here. You know, hopefully one of them, you know, start giving back and teaching, not just the pros, but, the, you know, I have, I, have, I have amateur team back home that I work with also. So, you know, you start teaching these kids. 
because if we don't start teaching them, pretty soon it's going to be a lost art. You know, and, and that's, that's, that'd be a very bad thing for boxing. Yeah, it would be very sad. Um, I was just seeing a lot of these former Soviet guys, I mean, they get funded, yeah. but the, the old school American professional knowledge if that dies, that'd be very sad because I mean those former Soviet guys they, they tend to all fight the same way. I mean part of the beauty of boxing was seeing how the different styles, you know, go up against each other. Yeah, you know, it's just, um, I'm like you. I, I just hope that in some way, in form or fashion, that people wake up and realize. You know, I don't know how it is here, but in the state, United States, it's not boxing, amateur boxing, not plentiful from a financial standpoint. They're still fighting. Yeah. But, you know, look, there's a lot of corruption in, in this also because everyone's trying to make a buck. You know, you might, I might buy a franchise. They, they, they have franchises now. Mm -hmm. The Golden Gloves. I might buy a franchise. You might buy them. I'm always trying to make a buck. I'm trying to get off the kids. You know, they're not really trying to help the kids get ahead in life. So. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a, it will, will be sad if it's lost. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you see the scene at the moment? Are there any fighters that you really think, yeah, this, these guys really have that old school American boxing ability. Believe it or not, you know, I'm going to tell you a, a good fighter that you know, lose a lot for a lot of bad things, but Tanner Davis, Cervantes, he can fight, man. You know, watch the stuff he does, it's old school. He's mm -hmm. slick, he's agile, he's quick, and he's smart, and he's very intelligent in you know, fighting. Yeah, and outside life may, may, may interfere with that, but inside the ring, man, he, he's a throwback fighter. He does all the things that old, old school fighters did. That's interesting you mentioned him because for us, the fans, the lay persons, we think of Tank Davis, we just think of that amazing knockout power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and he, possesses that, he possesses that also, which is nice for a lighter weight fighter. But you know, the boxing skill is definitely there for him. Well, I mean, on, on yourself, uh, who, was the, who was the best fighter you ever fought? Was it B Hop? Best fighter. Yeah. Believe it or not, no. You know, when I was very good. But I'm gonna say Reggie Johnson, the guy that won my middleweight title from. He was boxing, so uh -huh. you know, very, very calculated in what he did. He was one. He was, he was the only fighter I was ever genuinely worried about when I fought because he could box so well. And I, you know, I was kind of in doubt of myself for the first time that I could have boxing. You know, but I that bell rang, I, I did my thing. But no, Reggie Johnson was, he was smart. And he, you know, he had good, good, you know, decent power. Yeah. Decent speed. You know, I was just blessed to have more speed than him. You know, I was out there, man. I maneuvered, but he was definitely a smart, intelligent fighter. Mm -hmm. o on Clarissa, how, uh, how 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 high can she go? I mean, with her skill set, can she can, could she beat the heavyweights? Yeah, I mean, Clarissa, yeah. with Clarissa's, you know, her, her mindset and her skill set, she can do whatever she wants in boxing. She, you know, and I always tell her, I said, not a bad way. I tell her, don't take it wrong, but you fight like a guy. You fight like a man. You stop. You know, yeah, okay, most females don't fight the way you fight. It's a blessing for her. Mm -hmm. uh, so for her, the sky is the limit. Depends on how far she wants to take it. Uh, like she said, she doesn't really want to be a heavyweight. I mean, but you know, hey, if it's there, take a shot. One, one time deal, go do it like do it like Roy. One time deal, you win it, go back down. Uh -huh. Just make, this, <laughs> just, just, just make the, uh, the history. Yeah, exactly. And uh, just last thing on Magitov, we last saw him twist his ankle. Oh snap and uh, I remember you said it's going to be a long way back for him uh, yeah. is he is he planning on coming back well I see him on Instagram I see him working out uh, I don't know how bad knee I mean the, the ankle is, I see him working out so it definitely it must be repaired now but he's up in age you know how much time has he lost between that you know COVID just you know what's really left good, good, listen, good puncher intelligent fighter but he may be on the downside of his career, you know, yeah. and with even though it's been a long career in professional boxing, because he had a big, long amateur career when he should have turned pro to me mm -hmm. around 2012 at the latest. Yeah. Um, I just don't, and you know, unfortunately, once he broke his ankle, um, Eddie Hearns, they, they departed ways. Sure. So, who's going to take a chance on him at this stage of his career? Yeah, you know, there, there might be somebody that's hungry out there to promote it. It might not be the best guy for you, you know. Mm -hmm. And if I, you know, I mean, he's his country loves him. They take care of him. So I say, man, you know, when you get that money from your country, you know, relax. Yeah. Or just you know, start up a gym and you train fighters. Yeah. 
Well, John, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, taking us down memory lane and yeah. imparting some of that awesome knowledge of yours. Uh, anything you want to add? Yeah, listen, you, uh, they put all these um, celebrity bows on. Tell Cash up. So anybody get this message to him, let's do it a third time. Like, I got <laughs> yeah. I, I to gotta get you. I got to get you. <laughs> all right. If you fight a second time, I beat him his home. They gave him a decision. I beat him his hometown. I have a box of crap out. Um, so let's do it a third time and get paid. Okay, Jorge Castro, if you're in Buenos Aires somewhere, <laughs> get back into training. That's right, that's right. John David Jackson, thanks for speaking to the Boxing Boy. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to hit the like, subscribe, and share. As always, if you want to support us to the next level, head over to the patreon.com backslash the Boxing Boys. We have tons of exclusive from Border Wars, from Tidal, betting shows, the list goes on and on and on. But in addition to that, if you guys have questions for fighters, trainers, and promoters, this is where you can submit them. We will run out, get these questions answered, and put it back on the show just for you guys. Appreciate it. Peace.